Section two of Folklore and Legends English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends English by Charles John Tibbets Section two A Dissertation on Fairies by Joseph Ritson, Esquire Part One. The earliest mention of fairies is made by Homer, if, that is, his English translator has, in this instance, done him justice, where round the bed whence Achilles springs, the watery fairies dance in mazy rings. Iliad, B. 24, 617 these nymphs he supposes to frequent or reside in woods hills the sea fountains grottoes etc whence they are peculiarly called naiads dryads and nereids what sounds are those that gather from the shores the voice of nymphs that haunt the sylvan bowers the fair-haired dryads of the shady wood or azure daughters of the silver flood End quote. Odysseus B. 6. 122. The original word, indeed, is nymphs, which, it must be confessed, furnishes an accurate idea of the fays, fays or fates, of the ancient French and Italian romances, wherein they are represented as females of inexpressible beauty, elegance, and every kind of personal accomplishment, united with magic or supernatural power, such, for instance, as the Calypso of Homer, or the Elcina of Ariosto. Agreeably to this idea, it is that Shakespeare makes Antony say in allusion to Cleopatra, quote, To this great fairy I'll commend thy acts, end quote, meaning this grand assemblage of power and beauty. Such also is the character of the ancient nymphs, spoken of by the Roman poets, as Virgil, for instance, quote, Fortunatus et il, Deus qui novit agrestis, panaque sylvanumque senum, nymphasque sorores. End quote. Georgia, two, four ninety three. They, likewise, occur in other passages as well as in Horace. Quote, Gelidum nimus nymphorumque levis cum satiris cori. End quote. Camina 1, 0, 1, 5, 30. And, still more frequently, in Ovid. Not far from Rome, as we are told by Courier, was a place formerly called Ad Nymphus, and at this day Santa Nympha, which without doubt, he adds, in the language of our ancestors, would have been called the place of Fays. Recherche des Antiquites de Vienne, Lyon, 1659. The word Fay, or Fay, among the French, is derived, according to Du Cange, from the barbarous Latin fadus or fada, in Italian fata. Gervais of Tilbury, in his Ocia Imperialia, D. 3. C. 88, speaks of, quote, some of this kind of larvae, which they named fade, we have heard to be lovers, end quote and in his relation of a nocturnal contest between two knights, c. 94, he exclaims, quote, What shall I say? I know not if it were a true horse, or if it were a fairy, fadus, as men assert, end quote. From the Roman de Partene, or de Lesignan, manuscript, du Conge, cites, quote, Le chasteau fut fait une fée, si comme il est partout retrait. 
Hence, he says, fairy for spectres. Quote, Plusieurs parlant de Grenard, de Lou de Lagne et de Renard, de Ferry et de Songer, de Fantôme et de Messonger. End quote. The same Gervas explains the Latin fata, fay, French, a divining woman, an enchantress, or a witch, D. 3. C. 88. Master Wace, in his Histoire des Deux de Normandie, confounded by many with the Roman de Rue, describing the fountain of Barenton in Britannia, says, quote, En la forest, at environ, mais je ne sais par quelle raison la scutlen les fait vieillir, sur les bretons no dien vieillir. Etc. End quote. In the forest and around, I wot not by what reason found, there may a man the fairies spy, if Britons do not tell a lie. But it may be difficult to conceive an accurate idea from the mere name of the popular French fay or fairies of the twelfth century. In Vienne, in Dauphiny, is Le Puy des Fay, or Fairy Well. These fays, it must be confessed, have a strong resemblance to the nymphs of the ancients, who inhabited caves and fountains. Upon a little rock, which overlooks the Rhone, are three round holes which nature alone has formed, although it seem, at first sight, that art has labored after her. They say that they were formerly frequented by fays, that they were full of water when it rained, and that they there frequently took the pleasure of the bath, than which they had not one more charming. Corrier, Recherche, etc. Pomponius Mela, an eminent geographer, and in point of time far interior to Pliny, relates that beyond a mountain in Ethiopia, called by the Greeks the high mountain, burning, he says with perpetual fire is a hill spread over a long tract by extended shores whence they rather go see wide plains than to behold the habitations of pans and satyrs hence he adds this opinion received faith that whereas in these parts is nothing of culture no seats of inhabitants no footsteps a waste solitude in the day and a mere waste silence frequent fires shine by night and camps as it were are seen widely spread cymbals and tympans sound and sounding pipes are heard more than human b three c nine these invisible essences however are both anonymous and nondescript the Penates of the Romans, according to honest Reginald Scott, were, quote, the domestical gods, or rather divils, that were said to make men live quietly within doors. But some think that lares are, such as trouble private houses, larvae are said to be spirits that walk only by night. Vincili Terry are such as was Robin Goodfellow, that would supply the office of servants, specially of maids, as to make a fire in the morning, sweep the house, grind mustard and malt, draw water, etc. These also rumble in houses, draw latches, go up and down stairs, etc. Discovery of Witchcraft, London, 1584, page 521. A more modern writer says, quote, The Latins have called the fairies Larys and larvae, frequenting, as they say, houses delighting in neatness, pinching the slut, and rewarding the good housewife with money in her shoe. Passant, Treatise of Witches, 1673, page 53. This, however, is nothing but the character of an English fairy applied to the name of a Roman lar or larva. It might have been wished, too, that Scott, a man unquestionably 
of great learning had referred by name and work and book and chapter to those ancient authors from whom he derived his information upon the roman penates etc what idea our saxon ancestors had of the fairy which they called elf a word explained by lie as equivalent to lamia larva incubus aphialtes we are utterly at a loss to conceive the nymphs the satyrs and the fauns are frequently noticed by the old traditional historians of the north particularly saxo grammaticus who has a curious story of three nymphs of the forest and hother king of sweden and denmark being apparently the originals of the weird or wizard sisters of macbeth b three page thirty nine others are preserved by olanus magnus who says they had so deeply impressed into the earth that the place they have been used to having been apparently eaten up in a circular form with flagrant heat never brings forth fresh grass from the dry turf this nocturnal sport of monsters he adds the natives call the dance of the elves b three c ten Quote, in john Milesius, any man may read of devils in sarmatia honored called catri or kibaldi such as we pugs and hobgoblins call their dwellings be in corners of old houses least frequented or beneath stacks of wood and these convented make fearful noise in the buttries and in dairies robin goodfellows some some call them fairies in solitary rooms these uproars keep and beat at doors to wake men from their sleep seeming to force locks be they ne'er so strong and keeping Christmas gambles all night long. Pots, glasses, trenchers, dishes, pans, and kettles. They will make dance about the shelves and settles, as if about the kitchen toast and cast. Yet in the morning nothing found misplaced. End quote. Haywood's Hierarchy of Angels, 1635, F.O., page 574 milton a prodigious reader of romance has likewise given an apt idea of the ancient phase Quote, fairer than famed of old or fabled since of fairy damsels met in forest wide by knights of logris and of leons lancelot or peleus or pelinor End quote these ladies in fact are by no means unfrequent in those fabulous it must be confessed but at the same time ingenious and entertaining histories as for instance melusine or melusine the heroine of a very ancient romance in french verse and who was occasionally turned into a serpent morgan la fay a reputed half-sister of king arthur and the Lady of the Lake, so frequently noticed in Sir Thomas Mallory's old history of that monarch. Legrand is of opinion that what is called fairy comes to us from the Orientals, and that it is their genies which have produced our fairies, a species of nymphs of an order superior to those women magicians, to whom they nevertheless gave the same name. In Asia, he says, where the women imprisoned in the harems prove still beyond the general servitude a particular slavery the romancers have imagined the paris who flying in the air come to soften their captivity and render them happy fablio twelve mo one one twelve whether this be so or not it is certain that we call the aurora borealis or active clouds in the night peri dancers after all sir william ousley finds it impossible to give an accurate idea of what the persian poets designed by a peri this aerial being not resembling our fairies the strongest resemblance he can find is in the description of milton in comus the sublime idea which Milton entertained 
of a fairy vision corresponds rather with that which the Persian poets have conceived of the peris. Quote, Their port was more than human as they stood. I took it for a fairy vision of some gay creatures of the element that in the colors of the rainbow live and play in the plighted clouds. End quote. Disraeli's Romances, page 13. It is by no means credible, however, that Milton had any knowledge of the Oriental Peris, though his enthusiastic or poetical imagination might have easily peopled the air with spirits. There are two sorts of fays, according to M. Le Grand. The one a species of nymphs or divinities, the other more properly called sorceresses or women instructed in magic. From time immemorial, in the Abbey of Poissy, founded by St. Louis, they said every year a mass to preserve the nuns from the power of the fays. When the process of the damsel of Orléans was made, the doctors demanded for the first question, quote, if she had any knowledge of those who went to the Sabbath with the fays, or if she had not assisted at the assemblies held at the fountain of the fays, near Domprin, around which dance malignant spirits, end quote. The Journal of Paris, under Charles the Sixth and Charles the Seventh, pretends that she confessed that, at the age of twenty-seven years, she frequently went, in spite of her father and mother, to a fair fountain in the county of Lorraine, which she named the Good Fountain to the Face Our Lord. 1b, page 75. Gervas of Tilbury, in his chapter of Fawns and Satyrs, says, quote, There are likewise others, whom the vulgar call follets, who inhabit the houses of the simple rustics, and can be driven away neither by holy water nor exorcisms. And because they are not seen, they afflict those who are entering with stones, billets, and domestic furniture, whose words for certain are heard in the human manner, and their forms do not appear. Otia Imperialia D. 1. C. 18. He is speaking of England. This follet seems to resemble Puck or Robin Goodfellow, whose pranks were recorded in an old song and who was sometimes useful and sometimes mischievous, whether or not he was the fairy spirit of whom Milton, quote, tells how the drudging goblin sweat to earn his cream bowl duly set, when in one night, ere glimpse of morn, his shadowy flail hath threshed the corn that ten day laborers could not end, then lies him down, the lover fend, and stretched out all the chimney's length, basks at the fire his hairy strength, and crop full out of doors he flings, ere the first cock his matin rings. End quote. L'Allegro Is a matter of some difficulty. Perhaps the giant son of the witch that had the devil's mark about her of whom there is a pretty tale, that was called Lobley by the fire, was a very different personage from Robin Goodfellow, whom, however, he in some respects appears to resemble. A near female relation of the compiler, who was born and brought up in a small village in the bishopric of Durham, related to him many years ago several circumstances which confirmed the exactitude of Milton's description. She particularly told of his threshing the corn, churning the butter, drinking the milk, etc., and when all was done, quote, lying before the fire like a great rough hergen bear. End quote. In another chapter, Gervais says, quote, As among men, nature produces certain wonderful things, so spirits in airy bodies, who assume by divine permission the mocks they make. For behold, England has certain demons, demons I call them, though I know not, but I should say secret forms of unknown generation, whom the French call Neptunes, the English Portunes. With these it is natural that they take advantage of the simplicity of fortunate peasants, 
and when by reason of their domestic labors they perform their nocturnal vigils, of a sudden, the doors being shut, they warm themselves at the fire, and eat little frogs cast out of their bosoms, and put upon the burning coals. With an antiquated countenance, a wrinkled face, diminutive in stature, not having in length half a thumb, they are clothed with rags patched together, and if anything should be to be carried on in the house, or any kind of laborious work to be done, they join themselves to the work, and expedite it with more than human facility. It is natural to these, that they may be obsequious, and may not be hurtful. But one little mode, as it were, they have of hurting, for when among the ambiguous shades of night, the English occasionally ride alone, the portoon, sometimes unseen, couples himself to the rider, and when he has accompanied him, going on a very long time, at length, the bridle being seized, he leads him up to the hand in the mud, in which while, infixed, he wallows, the portoon, departing, sets up a laugh, and so in this kind of way derides human simplicity. End quote. Otia Imperialia D. 3. C. 61. This spirit seems to have some resemblance to the pick tree brag, a mischievous bar guest that used to haunt that part of the country in the shape of different animals, particularly of a little Galloway, in which shape a farmer, still or lately living thereabout, reported that it had come to him one night as he was going home, that he got upon it and rode very quietly till it came to a great pond, to which it ran and threw him in, and went laughing away. He further says there is in England a certain species of demons, which in their language they call Grant, like a one-year-old foal with straight legs and sparkling eyes. This kind of demon very often appears in the streets, in the very heat of the day, or about sunset, and as often as it makes its appearance, portends that there is about to be a fire in that city or town. When, therefore, in the following day or night the danger is urgent, in the streets, running to and fro, it provokes the dogs to bark, and while it pretends flight, invites them, following, to pursue, in the vain hope of overtaking it. This kind of illusion provokes caution to the watchmen who have the custody of fire, and so the officious race of demons, while they terrify the beholders, are wont to secure the ignorant by their arrival. Gervas D. 3. C. 62. Gower, in his tale of Narcissus, professedly from Ovid, says, quote, As he cast his look into the well, he saw the like of his visage, and when there were an image of such a nymph as though was Fay. End quote. Confessio Amantis F O twenty B In his legend of Constance is this passage quote, Thy wife which is of fairy of such a child delivered is fro kind which stant all amiss. End quote. Ibid F O thirty two B In another part of his book is a story how the king of Armenus' daughter met on a time a company of the fairy. End quote. These ladies ride aside on fair, white, ambulant horses, clad very magnificently, but all alike, in white and blue, and wore crowns on their heads. But they are not called fays in the poem, nor does the word fay or fairy once occur therein. The fairies or elves of the British Isles are peculiar to this part of the world, and are not, so far as literary information or oral tradition enables us to judge, to be found in any other country. For this fact the authority of Father Chaucer will be decisive, till we acquire evidence of equal antiquity in favor of other nations. 
quote, in old days of the King Arthur, of which the Bretons specken grit honour, all was this land fulfilled of fairy, the elf queen, with higher jolly company, danced full oft in many a gren med. This was the old opinion as I read. I speak of many hundred years ago, but now can no man see non elves mo, for now the great charity and prayers of limitures and other holy frares that search in every land and every stream as thick as motes in the sun abeam, blissing hollis, chambres, kitchenes, and burras, cities and burgas, castles high and tourists, thropes and burnis, shepens and dairies, this maketh that there been no fairies. End quote. Wife of Bath's Tale the fairy may be defined as a species of being partly material partly spiritual with a power to change its appearance and be to mankind visible or invisible according to its pleasure in the old song printed by peck robin goodfellow a well-known fairy professes that he had played his pranks from the time of merlin who was the contemporary of arthur Chaucer uses the word fairy as well as for the individual as for the country or system, or what we should now call fairyland, or fairyism. He knew nothing, it would seem, of Oberon, Titania, or Mab, but speaks of, quote, Pluto, that is the king of fairy, and many a lady in his company, following his wife, the queen Proserpina, etc. End quote. The Merchant's Tale, 1, 10101. From this passage of Chaucer, Mr. Turret, quote, cannot help thinking that his Pluto and Proserpina were the true progenitors of Oberon and Titania, end quote. In the process of the Wife of Bath's Tale, it happed the knight, quote, in his way to ride in all his care under a forest side, whereas he saw upon a dance go of ladies four and twenty, and yet mo, toward this like dance, he drowful yearn, in hope that he some wisdom should learn. But certainly, ere he came fully there, he vanished was this dance he wist not where. End quote. These ladies appear to have been fairies, though nothing is insinuated of their size, Milton seems to have been upon the prowl here for his forest side. In a Midsummer's Night Dream, a fairy addresses Bottom the Weaver, Hail, mortal, hail, which sufficiently shows she was not so herself. Puck, or Robin Goodfellow, in the same play, calls Oberon King of Shadows, and in the old song just mentioned, the King of Ghosts and Shadows. And this mighty monarch asserts of himself and his subjects. But we are spirits of another sort. The fairies, as we already see, were male and female. Their government was monarchical, and Oberon, the king of fairyland, must have been a sovereign of very extensive territory. The name of his queen was Titania. Both are mentioned by Shakespeare, being personages of no little importance in the above play where they, in an ill humor, thus encounter Oberon. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. What jealous Oberon, fairy, skip hence, I have forsworn his bed and company. That the name Oberon was not the invention of our great dramatist is sufficiently proved. The allegorical Spencer gives it to King Henry the Eighth. Robert Green was the author of a play entitled the Scottish History of James the Fourth, intermixed with a pleasant comedy presented by Oberon, King of the Fairies. He is, likewise, a character in the old French romances of Juan de Bordeaux and Ogier Le Danois, and there even seems to be one upon his own exploits, Roman Oberon. What authority, however, Shakespeare had for the name Titania, it does not appear, 
nor is she so called by any other writer. He himself, at the same time, as, well, as many others, gives to the Queen of Fairies the name of Mab, though no one except Drayton mentions her as the wife of Oberon. Oh, then, I see, Queen Mab hath been with you. She is the fairy's midwife, and she comes in shape no bigger than an agate stone, on the forefinger of an alderman, drawn with a team of little atomies, athwart men's noses as they lie asleep. Her wagon spokes made of long spinner's legs, the cover of the wings of grasshoppers, the traces of the smallest spider's web, the collars of the moonshine's watery beams, her whip of cricket's bone, the lash of film, her wagoner a small gray-coated gnat, not half so big as a round little worm pricked from the lazy finger of a maid. Her chariot is an empty hazelnut, made by the joiner squirrel, or old grub, time out of mind the fairy's coachmakers. And in this state she gallops night by night through lovers' brains, and then they dream of love. This is that very Mab, that plates the manes of horses in the night, and bakes the elf locks in foul sluttish hair, which once untangled much misfortune bodes. Romeo and Juliet Ben Jonson, in his entertainment of the Queen and Prince at Althrope, in 1603, describes to come tripping up the lawn a bevy of fairies attending on Mab their queen, who, falling into an artificial ring that was there cut in the path, began to dance around. Works 5. 201 In the same mask, the queen is thus characterized by a satyr. This is Mab, the mistress fairy, that doth nightly rob the dairy, and can hurt or help the churning, as she please, without discerning, she that pinches country wenches, if they rub not clean their benches, and with sharper nails remembers when they rake not up their embers. But if so they chance to feast her, in a shoe she drops a tester. This is she that empties cradles, takes out children, puts in ladles, trains forth midwives in their slumber, with a sieve the holes to number, and thus leads them from her burrows, home through ponds and water furrows. She can start our Franklin's daughters in their sleep with shrieks and laughters, and on sweet St. Agnes' night feed them with a promised sight, some of husbands, some of lovers, which an empty dream discovers. End of section 2「The old English folklore tales are fast dying out. The simplicity of character, necessary for the retaining of old memories and beliefs, is being lost, more rapidly in England, perhaps, than in any other part of the world. Our folk are giving up the old myths for new ones. Before remorseless progress and the struggle for existence, the poetry of life is being quickly blotted out. In editing this volume, I have endeavoured to select some of the best specimens of our folklore. With regard to the nursery tales, I have taken pains to give them as they are in the earliest editions I could find. I must say, however, that while I have taken every care to alter only as much as was absolutely necessary in these tales, some excision and slight alteration has at times been required. End of section 1 
Section three of Folklore and Legends English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Folklore and Legends English by Charles John Tibbets. A Dissertation on Fairies, Part 2. Fairies, they tell you, have frequently been heard and seen. Nay, that there are some living who were stolen away by them and confined seven years according to the description they give who pretend to have seen them they are in the shape of men exceeding little they are always clad in green and frequent the woods and fields when they make cakes which is a work they have been often heard at they are very noisy and when they have done they are full of mirth and pastime but generally they dance in moonlight when mortals are asleep and not capable of seeing them as may be observed on the following morn their dancing places being very distinguishable for as they dance hand in hand and so make a circle in their dance so next day there will be seen rings and circles on the grass borns antiquatis fugares newcastle seventeen twenty five eighth volume page eighty two these circles are thus described by brown the author of britannia's pastorals a pleasant mead where fairies often did their measures treed which in the meadows made such circles green as if with garlands it had crowned been within one of these round was to be seen a hillock rise where oft the fairy queen at twilight sate and did command her elves to pinch those maids that had not swept their shelves and further if by maidens oversight within doors water were not brought at night or if they spread no table set no bread they should have nips from toe unto the head and for the maid that had performed each thing she in the water pill bad leave a ring the same poet in a chapiard's pipe having inserted hockleaf's tale of jonathus and conceiving a strange unnatural affection for that stupid fellow describes him as a great favourite of the fairies alleging that many times he hath be seen with the fairies on the green and to them his pipe did sound while they danced in a round mickle solace would they make him and at midnight often wake him and convey him from his room to a field of yellow broom or into the meadows where mints perfumed the gentle air and where the flora spends her treasure there they would begin their measure if it chanced night's stable shrouds muffled cynthia up in clouds safely home they then would see him and from bricks and quagmires free him the fairies were exceedingly diminutive but it must be confessed we shall not readily find their real dimensions they were small enough however if we may believe one of queen titania's maids of honour to conceal themselves in acorn shells speaking of a difference between the king and queen she says but they do square that all the elves for fear creep into acorn cups and hide them there they uniformly and constantly wore green vests unless when they had some reason for changing their dress of this circumstance we meet with many proofs thus in the merry wives of windsor like urchins oofs and fairies green in fact we meet with them of all colours as in the same play fairies black grey green and white that white on occasion was the dress of a female we learn from reginald scott he gives a charm to go invisible by means of these three sisters of fairies milia achilia sibylia i charge you that you do appear before me visible in form and shape of fair women in white vestures and to bring with you to me the ring of invisibility by the which i may go invisible at mine own will and pleasure and that in all hours and minutes it was fatal if you may believe shakespeare to speak of a fairy falstaff in the merry wives of windsor is made to say they are fairies he that speaks to them shall die they were accustomed to enrich their favourites as we learn from the clown in a winter's tale it was told me i should be rich by the fairies 
they delighted in neatness could not endure sluts and even hated fibsters tell-tales and their vultures of secrets whom they would slyly and severely be pinch when they little expected it they were as generous and benevolent on the contrary to young women of a different description procuring them the sweetest sleep the pleasantest dreams and on their departure in the morning always slipping a tester in their shoe they are supposed by some to have been malignant but this it may be was mere calumny as being utterly inconsistent with their general character which was singularly innocent and amiable imogen in shakespeare's cymbeline prays on going to sleep from fairies and the tempters of night guard me beseech you it must have been the incubus she was so afraid of hamlet too notices this imputed malignity of the fairies then no planet strike no fairy takes nor witch has power to charm thus also in the comedy of errors a fiend a fairy pitiless and rough they were amazingly expeditious in their journeys puck or robin goodfellow answers oberon who was about to send him on a secret expedition i'll put a girdle round about the earth in forty minutes again the same goblin addresses him thus fairy king attend and mark i do hear the morning lark then my queen in silent sand trip we after the night shade we the globe can compass soon swifter than the wandering moon in another place puck says my fairy lord this must be done in haste for night's swift dragons get the clouds full fast and yonder shines aurora's harbinger at whose approach ghosts wandering here and there troop home to churchyards etc to which oberon replies but we are spirits of another sort i with the morning's love have oft made sport and like a forester the groves may tread even till the eastern gate all fiery red opening on neptune with fair blessed beams turns into yellow gold his salt green streams compare likewise what robin himself says on this subject in the old song of his exploits they never ate but that it eats our victuals i should think here were a fairy says valerius at the first sight of imogen as fidele they were humanely attentive to the youthful dead thus guderius at the funeral of the above lady with female fairies will his tomb be haunted or as in the pathetic dirge of collins on the same occasion no withered witch shall here be seen no goblins lead their nightly crew the female fae shall haunt the green and dress the grave with pearly dew this amiable quality is likewise thus beautifully alluded to by the same poet by fairy hands their knell is rung by forms unseen their dirge is sung their employment is thus charmingly represented by shakespeare in the address of prospero ye elves of hills brooks standing lakes and groves and ye that on the sands with printless foot do chase the ebbing neptune and do fly him when he comes back you demi puppets that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make whereof the you not bites and you whose pastime is to make midnight mushrooms that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew in the midsummer night's dream the queen titania being desirous to take a nap says to her female attendants come now a roundel and a fairy song then for the third part of a minute hence some to kill cankers in the musk rosebuds some war with rear mice for their leathern wings to make my small elves coats and some keep back the clamorous owl that nightly hoots and wonders at our crane spirits sing me now asleep then to your offices and let me rest Milton gives a most beautiful and accurate description of the little green coast of his native soil, than which nothing can be more happily or justly expressed. He had certainly seen them in this situation with the poet's eye. Fairy elves, 
whose midnight revels by a forest side or fountain some belated peasant sees or dreams he sees while overhead the moon sits arbitress and nearer to the earth wheels her pale course they on their mirth and dance intent with jocund music charm his ear at once with joy and fear his heart rebounds the impression they made upon his imagination in early life appears from his vacation exercise at the age of nineteen good luck befriend thee son for at thy birth the fairy ladies danced upon the hearth the drowsy nurse had sworn she did them spy come tripping to the room where thou didst lie and sweetly singing round about thy bed strew all their blessings on thy sleeping head l'abbé bourdelon in his ridiculous extravagances of m Ouflet, describes the fairies of which he says grandmothers and nurses tell so many tales to children these fairies adds he i mean who are affirmed to be blind at home and very clear-sighted abroad who dance in the moonshine when they have nothing else to do who steal shepherds and children to carry them up to their caves etc english translation page one hundred and ninety the fairies have already called themselves spirits ghosts or shadows and consequently they never died a position at the same time of which there is every kind of proof that a fact can require the reviser of johnson and stephen's edition of shakespeare in seventeen eighty five makes a ridiculous reference to the allegories of spencer and a palpably false one to tickles kensington gardens which he affirms will show that the opinion of fairies dying prevailed in the last century whereas in fact it is found on the slightest glance into the poem to maintain the direct reverse meanwhile sad kenna loath to quit the grove hung o'er the body of her breathless love tried every art vain arts to change his doom and vowed vain vows to join him in the tomb what would she do the fates alike deny the dead to live or fairy forms to die the fact is so positively proved that no editor or commentator of shakespeare present or future will ever have the folly or impudence to assert that in shakespeare's time the notion of fairies dying was generally known ariosto informs us in harrington's translation book ten section forty seven that either ancient folk believed a lie or this is true a fairy cannot die and again book forty three section ninety two i am a fairy and to make you know to be a fairy what it doth import we cannot die how old so ere we grow of pains and harms of every other sort we test only no death we nature owe beaumont and fletcher in the faithful shepherdess describe a virtue as well about whose flowery banks the nimble-footed fairy stands their rounds by the pale moonshine dipping oftentimes their stolen children so to make them free from dying flesh and dull mortality puck alias robin goodfellow is the most active and extraordinary fellow of a fairy that we anywhere meet with and it is believed we find him nowhere but in our own country and peradventure also only in the south spencer it would seem is the first that alludes to his name of puck ne let the pook nor other evil sprite ne let hobgoblins names whose sense we see not fray us with things that be not in our childhood says reginald scott our mother's maids have so terrified us with an ogy devil having horns on his head fire in his mouth and a tail eyes like a basin fangs like a dog claws like a bear a skin like a niger and a voice roaring like a lion whereby we start and are afraid when we hear one cry bo and they have so frayed us with bull beggars spirits witches urchins elves hags fairies satyrs pans silence kit with the canstick tritons centaurs dwarfs giants imps calkers conjurers nymphs changeling incubus robin goodfellow the sporn the mare the man in the oak the hellwain the fire drake the puckle tom thumb hobgoblin tom tumbler 
boneless and such other bugs that we are afraid of our own shadows discovery of richcraft london 1584 fourth tome page 153 i know you this by the way he says that heretofore robin goodfellow and hobgoblin were as terrible and also as credible to the people as hags and witches be now and in truth they that maintain walking spirits have no reason to deny robin goodfellow upon whom there hath gone as many and as credible tales as upon witches saving that it hath not pleased the translators of the bible to call spirits by the name of robin goodfellow page one hundred and thirty one your grandam's maid says he were wont to set a bowl of milk before incubus and his cousin robin goodfellow for grinding of malt or mustard and sweeping the house at midnight and you have also heard that he would chafe exceedingly if the maid or good wife of the house having compassion of his naked state laid any clothes for him besides his mess of white bread and milk which was his standing fee for in that case he saith, what have we here hampton hampton here will i never more tread nor stamp in discovery of witchcraft page eighty five robin is thus characterized in the midsummer night's dream by a female fairy either i mistake your shape and making quite or else you are that shrewd and knavish sprite called robin goodfellow are you not he that fright the maidens of the villagery skim milk and sometimes label in the quern and bootless make the breathless housewife churn and sometimes make the drink to bear no barm his lead night wanderers laughing at their harm those that hobgoblin call you and sweet puck you do their work and they shall have good luck to these questions robin thus replies thou speaks the right i am that merry wonder of the night i jest to oberon and make him smile when i a fat and bean fed horse beguile neighing in likeness of a filly foal and sometimes lurk i in a gossip's bowl in very likeness of a roasted crab and when she drinks against her lips i bawl and on her withered dewlap pour the ale the wisest aunt telling the saddest tale sometime for three foot stole mistaketh me then slip i from her bum down topples she and taylor cries and falls into a cuff and then the whole choir hold their hips and laugh and waxen in their mirth and knees and swear a merrier hour was never wasted there his usual exclamation in this play is ho 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 coward why comest thou not so in grim the collier of croydon ho 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 my masters no good fellowship is robin goodfellow a bugbear grown that he is not worthy to be bid sit down in the song printed by peck he concludes every stanza with ho 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 if that the bowl of curds and cream were not duly set out for robin goodfellow the friar and sissy the darrow maid why then either the pottage was so burned to next day in the pot or the cheeses would not curdle or the butter would not come or the ale and the fat never would have good head but if a peter penny or a household egg were behind or a patch of tithe unpaid then beware of bull beggars spirits etc this frolicsome spirit thus describes himself in johnson's mask of love restored robin goodfellow he that sweeps the hearth and the house clean riddles for the country maids and does all their other drudgery while they are at hot cockles one has conversed with your court spirits ere now having recounted several ineffectual attempts he had made to gain admittance he adds in this despair when all invention and translation too failed me i even went back and stuck to this shape you see me in of mine own with my broom and my cannels and came on confidently the mention of his broom reminds us of a passage in another play midsummer night's dream where he tells the audience i am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door he is likewise one of the dramati spersoni in the old play of wily beguiled in which he says tush fear not the dodge 
I'll rather put on my flashing red nose and my flaming face and come wrapped in a calfskin and cry bo bo I'll pay the scholar a warranty Harshnet's Declaration London 1604 Fourth Tone his character however in this piece is so diabolical and so different from anything one could expect in robin goodfellow that it is unworthy of further quotation he appears likewise in another entitled grim the collier of croydon in which he enters in a suit of leather close to his body his face and hands coloured russet colour with a flail he is here too in most respects the same strange and diabolical personage that he is represented in wily beguiled only there is a single passage which reminds us of his old habits when as i list in this transformed disguise i'll fright the country people as i pass and sometimes turn me to some other form and so delude them with fantastic shows but woe betide the silly dairy maids for i shall fleet their cream bowls night by night in another scene he enters while some of the other characters are at a bowl of cream upon which he says i love a mess of cream as well as they i think it were best i stepped in and made one ho 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 my masters no good fellowship is robin goodfellow a bugbear grown that he is not worthy to be bid sit down there is indeed something characteristic in this passage but all the rest is totally foreign dr percy bishop of dromore has reprinted in his relics of ancient english poetry a very curious and excellent old ballad originally published by peck who attributes it but with no similitude to ben jonson in which robin goodfellow relates his exploit with singular humour to one of these copies he says were prefixed two wooden cuts which seemed to represent the dresses in which his whimsical character was formerly exhibited upon the stage in this conjecture however the learned and ingenious editor was most egregiously mistaken these cuts being manifestly printed from the identical blocks made use of by bulwer in his artificial changeling printed in sixteen fifteen the first being intended for one of the black and white gallants of seal day adorned with the moon stars etc the other a hairy savage burton speaking of fairies says that a bigger kind there is of them called with hobgoblins and robin goodfellows that would in those superstitious times grind corn for a mess of milk cut wood or do any kind of drudgery work afterward of the demons that mislead men in the night he says we commonly call them pucks anatomy of melancholy cartwright in the ordinary introduces moth repeating this curious charm st francis and st benedite blessed this house from wicked white from the nightmare and the goblin that is hight goodfellow robin keep it from all evil spirits fairies weasels rats and ferrets from curfew time to the next prime act three scene one this puck or robin goodfellow seems likewise to be the illusory candle holder so fatal to travellers and was more usually called jack-o'-lantern or will with a wisp and as it would seem from a passage elsewhere cited from scott kit with the canstick thus a fairy in a passage shakespeare had already quoted asked robin are you not he that frights the maiden of the villagery misleads night wanderers laughing at their harm milton alludes to this deceptive gleam in the following lines a wandering fire a compact of unctuous vapour which the night condenses and the cold inference round kindled through agitation to a flame which oft they say some evil spirit attends hovering and blazing with delusive light misleads the amazed night wanderer from his way to bogs and mires and oft through pond and pool paradise lost book nine he elsewhere calls him the friar's lantern la lego this facetious spirit only misleads the benighted traveller generally an honest farmer in his way from the market in a state of intoxication for the joke's sake 
as one very seldom if ever hears any of his deluded followers who take it to be the torch of hero in some hospitable mansion affording provision for man and horse perishing in these ponds or pools through which they dance or plunge after him so merrily there go as many tales says reginald scott upon hudgen in some parts of germany as there did in england of robin goodfellow friar rush was for all the world such another fellow as this hudgen and brought up even in the same school to wit in a kitchen inasmuch as the self-same tale is written of the one as of the other concerning the scullion who is said to have been slain etc for the reading whereof i refer you to friar rush's story or else to john wierus the prestigious daemonum in the old play of gammer girton's needle printed in fifteen seventy five hodge describing a great black devil which had been raised by dickon the bedlam and being asked by gammer but hodge had he no horns to push replies as long as your two arms saw ye never friar rush painted on a cloth with a sidelong cow's tail and crooked cloven feet and many a hooked nail for all the world if i should judge should reckon him his brother look even what face friar rush had the devil had such another the fairies frequented many parts of the bishopric of durham there is a hillock or tumulus near bishopton and the large hill near billingham both which used in former time to be haunted by fairies even fairy hill a well-known stage between darlington and durham is evidently a corruption of fairy hill when seen by accident or favour they are described as of the smallest size and uniformly habited in green they could however occasionally assume a different size and appearance as a woman who has been admitted into their society challenged one of the guests whom she espied in the market selling fairy butter this freedom was deeply resented and cost her the eyes she first saw him with mr brand mentions his having met with the man who said he had seen one who had seen the fairies truth he adds is to be come at in most cases none he believes ever came nearer to it in this than he has done however that may be the present editor cannot pretend to have been more fortunate his informant related that an acquaintance in westmoreland having a great desire and praying earnestly to see a fairy was told by a friend if not a fairy in disguise that on the side of such a hill at such a time of day he should have a sight of one and accordingly at the time and place appointed the hobgoblin in his own words stood before him in the likeness of a green coat lad but in the same instant the spectator's eye glancing vanished into the hill this he said the man told him the streets of newcastle says mr brand were formerly so vulgar tradition has it haunted by a nightly gust which appeared in the shape of a mastiff dog etc and terrified such as were afraid of shadows i have heard he adds when a boy many stories concerning it the no less famous Barguest of Durham and the Pictree Bragg have been already alluded to. The former, beside its many other pranks, would sometimes, at the dead of night, in passing through the different streets, set up the most horrid and continuous shrieks to scare the poor girls who might happen to be out of bed. The compiler of the present sheets remembers, when very young, to have heard a respectable old woman, then a midwife of Stockton, relate that when in her youthful days she was a servant at durham being up late one saturday night cleaning the irons in the kitchen she heard these strikes first at a great and then at the less distance till at length the loudest and most horrible that can be conceived just at the kitchen window sent her upstairs she did not know how where she fell into the arms of a fellow-servant who could scarcely prevent her fainting away pioneers or diggers for metal according to lavater do affirm that in many minds there appear strange shapes and spirits who are apparelled like unto other labourers in the pit these wander up and down in caves and underminings and seem to bestir themselves in all kinds of labour as to dig after the vein to carry together ore to put it in baskets and to turn the winding wheel to draw it up 
when in very deed they do nothing less they very seldom hurt the labourers as they say except they provoked them by laughing and railing at them for then they threw gravel stones at them or hurt them by some other means these are especially haunting in pits where metal most abounds of ghosts etc london fifteen seventy two fort tome page seventy three this is our great milton's smart fairy of the mine simple foolish men imagine i know not how that there be certain elves or fairies of the earth and tell many strange and marvellous tales of them which they have heard of their grandmothers and mothers how they have appeared unto those of the house have done service have rocked the cradle and which is a sign of good luck do continually tarry in the house of ghosts etc page forty nine mallet though without citing any authority says after all the notion is not everywhere exploded that there are in the bowels of the earth fairies or a kind of dwarfish and tiny beings of human shape and remarkable for their riches their activity and malevolence in many countries of the north the people are still firmly persuaded of their existence in ireland at this day the good folk show the very rocks and hills in which they maintain that there are swarms of these small subterraneous men of the most tiny size but the most delicate figures northern antiquities etc two forty seven there is not a more generally received opinion throughout the principality of wales than that of the existence of fairies amongst the commonalty it is indeed universal and by no means infrequently credited by the second ranks fairies are said at a distant period to have frequented busters hill and st mary's island but their nightly pranks aerial gambols and cockle-shell abodes are now quite unknown heath's account of the islands of scilly page one hundred and twenty nine evil spirits called fairies are frequently seen in several of the isles of orkney dancing and making merry and sometimes seen in armour brand's description of orkney edinburgh seventeen o three page sixty one end of section three recording by phone Section four of Folklore and Legends English This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Recording by Daphne Ma Folklore and Legends English by Charles John Tibbets Section four a farmstead in situated near the borders of Northumberland, a few miles from Holtzar, was once occupied by a family of the name W. K. N. In front of the dwelling house, and at about sixty yards distance, lay a stone of vast size, as ancient, for so tradition amplifies the date, as the flood. On this stone, at the dead hour of the night, might be discerned a female figure wrapped in grey cloak with one of those low-crowned black bonnets so familiar to her grandmothers upon her head she was incessantly knock knock knocking in a fruitless endeavour to split the impenetrable rock dahlia's night came round she occupied her lonely station in the same low crouching attitude and pursued the dreary obligations of her destiny till the grey streaks of the dawn gave up to mission to depart from this the only perceptible action in which she engaged she obtained the name of nelly the knocker so perfectly had the inmates of the farmhouse in the lapse of time which will reconcile sights and events the most disagreeable and alarming become accustomed to nelly undeviating nightly din that the work went forward unimpeded and undisturbed by any apprehension occurring from her shadowy presence did the servant man make his punctual resort to the neighbouring cottages he took the liberty of scrutinising nelly's antiquated carp that varied not with the vicissitudes of seasons 
or he pried sympathetically into the progress of her monotonous occupation, and through her pale, ghastly, contracted features gave a momentarily pang of terror, it was rapidly affected in the vortex of good fellowship into which he was speedily drawn. Did the loon venture an appointment with his mistress at the rustic style of her stockgarth, Nelly's unwearied hammer, instead of proving a barrier, only served by imparting a grateful sense of mutual danger to render more intense the raptures of the hour of meeting. So apathetic were the feelings cherished towards her, and so little jealousy existed of her power to injure, that the relator of the circumstances states that on several occasions she has passed Nelly at her laborious toil without evincing the slightest perturbation beyond a hurried step as he stole a glance in the explicable and mysterious form. An event in the course of years disclosed the secrets that marvellous stone shrouded and drove poor Nelly forever from the scene so inscrutably linked with her fate. Two of the sons of the farmer were rapidly approaching maturity, when one of them, more reflecting and shrewd than his compeers, suggested the idea of relieving Nelly from her toilsome avocation and of taking possession of the alluring legacy to which he was evidently and urgently summoning. He proposed conjointly with his father and brother to blast the stone as the most expeditious mode of gaining access to her arcana and this in the open daylight in order that any tutelary protection she might be disposed to extend to her favourite haunt might, as he was a thing of darkness and the night, be effectually countervailed. Nor were their hopes frustrated, for upon clearing away the earth and fragments that resulted from the explosion, there was revealed to their elated and admiring gaze a precious booty of closely packed urns copiously enriched with gold. Anxious that no imitation of their good fortune should transpire, they had taken the precaution to dispatch the female servant on a needless errand, and ere her return the whole treasure was efficiently and completely secured. So completely did they succeed in keeping their own counsel, and so successfully did their reputation keep pace with the cautious production of their undivulged treasures, that for many years afterwards they were never suspected of gaining any advantage for poor Nelly's knocking, their improved appearance and the somewhat imposing figure that they made in their little district being solely attributed to their superior judgment and to the good management of their lucky farm. End of section 4 Recording by Daphne Ma Section 5 of the Folklore and Legends, English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arjun Anand. Folklore and Legends, English by Charles John Tibbets. The Three Fools There was once a good-looking girl, the daughter of well-off country folk, who was loved by an honest young fellow named John. He courted her for a long time, and at last got her and her parents to consent to his marrying her, which was to come off in a few weeks' time. One day, as the girl's father was working in his garden, he sat down to rest himself by the well, and looking in and seeing how deep it was, he fell a-thinking. If Jane had a child, said he to himself, who knows but that one day it might play about here and fall in and be killed. The thought of such a thing filled him with sorrow, and he sat crying into the well for some time until his wife came to him. What is the matter? asked she. What are you crying for? Then the man told her his thoughts. If Jane marries and has a child, said he, who knows but it might play about here and some day fall into the well and be killed. Alack! cried the woman. I 
never thought of that before. It is indeed possible. So she sat down and wept with her husband. As neither of them came to the house, the daughter shortly came to look for them. And when she found them sitting crying into the well, What is the matter? asked she. Why do you weep? So her father told her of the thought that had struck him. Yes, said she, it might happen. So she too sat down with her father and mother and wept into the well. They had sat there a good while when John comes to them. What has made you so sad? asked he. So the father told him what had occurred and said that he should be afraid to let him have his daughter, seeing her child, might fall into the well. You are three fools, said the young man. When he had heard him to an end, and leaving them, he thought over whether he should try to get Jane for his wife or not. At length he decided that he would marry her if he could find three people more foolish than her and her father and mother. He put on his boots and went out. I will walk till I wear these boots out, said he, and if I find three more foolish people before I am barefoot, I will marry her. So he went on and walked very far till he came to a barn, at the door of which stood a man with a shovel in his hands. He seemed to be working very hard, shoveling the air in at the door. What are you doing? asked John. I am shoveling in the sunbeams, replied the man, to ripen the corn. Why don't you have the corn out in the sun for it to ripen it? asked John. Good, said the man. Why, I never thought of that. Good luck to you, for you have saved me. Many a weary day's work. That's fool number one, said John, and went on. He travelled a long way, until one day he came to a cottage. Against the wall of it was placed a ladder, and a man was trying to pull a cow up it by means of a rope, one end of which was round the cow's neck. What are you about? asked John. Why, replied the man, I want the cow up on the roof to eat off that fine tuft of grass you see growing there. Why don't you cut the grass and give it to the cow? asked John. Why now? I never thought of that, answered the man. So I will, of course, and many thanks, for many a good cow have I killed in trying to get it up there. That's fool number two, said John to himself. He walked on a long way thinking there were more fools in the world than he had thought, and wondering what would be the next one he should meet. He had to wait a long time, however, and to walk very far, and his boots were almost worn out before he found another. One day, however, he came to a field, in the middle of which he saw a pair of trousers standing up, being held up by sticks. A man was running about them and jumping over and over them. Hello, cried John. What are you about? Why, said the man. What need is there to ask? Don't you see? I want to get the trousers on. So saying, he took two or three more runs and jumps, but always jumped either to this side or that of the trousers. Why don't you take the trousers and draw them on? Asked John. Good, said the man. Why, I never thought of it. Many thanks. I only wish you had come before, for I have lost a great deal of time in trying to jump into them. That, said John, is fool number three. So, as his boots were not yet quite worn out, he returned to his home and went again to ask Jane of her father and mother. At last they gave her to him, and they lived very happily together, for John had a rail put around the well and the child did not fall into it. End of the Three Fools Section 6 of Folklore and Legends, English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbets. Some Merry Tales of the Wise Men of Gotham. Till First 
There were two men of Gotham, and one of them was going to the market at Nottingham to buy sheep, and the other was coming from the market, and both met together on Nottingham Bridge. Well met, said the one to the other. Whither are you a-going? said he that came from Nottingham. Mary, said he that was going thither, I'm going to the market to buy sheep. Buy sheep, said the other, and which way will you bring them home? Mary, said the other, I will bring them over this bridge. By Robin Hood, said he that came from Nottingham, but thou shalt not. By Maid Marjoram, said he that was going thither, but I will. Thou shalt not, said the one. I will, said the other. Tut here, said the one, and tut there, said the other. Then they beat their staves against the ground, one against the other, as if there had been a hundred sheep betwixt them. Hold them there, said one. Beware of the leaping over the bridge of my sheep, said the other. I care not. They shall all come this way, said the one. But they shall not, said the other. As they were in contention, another wise man that belonged to Gotham came from the market with a sack of meal upon his horse, and seeing and hearing his neighbours at strife about sheep, and none betwixt them, said he, Ah, fools, will you never learn wit? Then help me, said he that had the meal, and laid his sack upon my shoulder. They did so, and he went to one side of the bridge, and unloosed the mouth of the sack, and shook out the meal into the river. Then said he, How much meal is there in the sack, neighbours? Mary, answered they, none. Now, by my faith, replied this wise man, even so much wit is there in your two heads to strive concerning that thing which you have not. Now, which was the wisest of all these three persons, I leave you to judge. Tale second. On a time, the men of Gotham fain would have pinned in the cuckoo, whereby she should sing all the year, and in the midst of their town they had a hedge made round in compass, and they got the cuckoo and put her into it, and said, Sing here, and you shall lack neither meat nor drink all the year. The cuckoo, when she perceived herself encompassed within the hedge, flew away. A vengeance on her, said the wise men. We made not our hedge high enough. Tale third. There was a man of Gotham who went to the market of Nottingham to sell cheese, and, as he was going down the hill to Nottingham Bridge, one of his cheese fell out of his wallet, and ran down the hill. What, said the fellow, can you run to the market alone? I will now send one after the other. Then laying down the wallet, and taking out the cheese, he tumbled them down the hill, one after the other, and some ran into one bush, and some into another, so at last he said, I do charge you to meet me in the market-place. And when the man came into the market to meet the cheese, he stayed until the market was almost done, then went and inquired of his neighbours and other men if they did see his cheese come to market. Why, who should bring them? said one of his neighbours. Mary, themselves, said the fellow. They knew the way well enough, said he. A vengeance on them, for I was afraid to see my cheese run so fast that they would run beyond the market. I am persuaded that they are by this time almost at York. So he immediately takes a horse and rides after them to York, but was very much disappointed. But to this day no man has ever heard of the cheese. Tale Fourth When that good Friday was come, the men of Gotham did cast their heads together what to do with their white herrings, red herrings, their sprats and salt fish. Then one counselled with the other, and agreed that all such fish should be cast up into the pond or pool, which was in the middle of the town, that the number of them might increase against the next year. Therefore every one that had got any fish left did cast them into the pond. Then one said, I have as yet gotten left so many red herrings. Well, said the other, and I have left so many whitings. Another immediately cried out, I have as yet gotten so many sprats left. And, said the last, I have got so many salt fishes. 
let them all go together into the great pond without any distinction and we may be sure to fare like lords the next year at the beginning of the next lent they immediately went about drawing the pond imagining they should have the fish but were much surprised to find nothing but a great eel ah said they a mischief on this eel for he hath eaten up our fish what must we do with him said one to the other kill him said one to the other chop him into pieces said another nay not so said the other but let us drown him be it accordingly so replied they all so they immediately went to another pond and did cast the eel into the water lie there said these wise men and shift for thyself since you can expect no help from us so they left the eel to be drowned till fifth on a certain time there were twelve men of gotham that went a-fishing and some did wade in the water and some did stand upon dry land and when they went homeward one said to the other we have ventured wonderful hard this day in wading i pray god that none of us may have come from home to be drowned nay mary said one to the other let us see that for there did twelve of us come out then they told themselves and every man told eleven and the twelfth man did never tell himself alas said the one to the other there are some of us drowned they went back to the brook where they had been fishing and did make a great lamentation a courtier did come riding by and did ask what it was they sought for and why they were so sorrowful oh said they this day we went to fish in the brook and here did come out twelve of us and one of us is drowned why said the courtier tell me how many there be of you and the one said eleven and he did not tell himself well said the courtier what will you give me and i will find out twelve men sir said they all the money we have got give me the money said the courtier and began with the first and gave a recommendabus over the shoulder which made him groan saying here is one and so he served them all that they groaned up the matter when he came to the last he paid him well saying here is the twelfth man god's blessing on thy heart for finding out our dear brother tale sixth a man's wife of gotham had a child and the father bid the gossips which were children of eight or ten years of age the eldest child's name who was to be godfather was called gilbert the second child's name was humphrey and the godmother's name was christabel the friends of all of them did admonish them saying that divers of times they must say after the priest when they were all come to the church door the priest said be you all agreed of the name be you all said gilbert agreed of the name the priest then said wherefore do you come hither gilbert said wherefore do you come hither humphrey said wherefore do you come hither and christabel said wherefore do you come hither the priest being amazed he could not tell what to say but whistled and said whew gilbert whistled and said whew humphrey whistled and said whew and so did christabel the priest being angry said go home fools go home then said gilbert and humphrey and christabel the same the priest then himself provided for godfathers and godmothers here a man may see that children can do nothing without good instruction and that they are not wise who regard them end of section six recording by phone section seven of folklore and legends english this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org folklore and legends english by charles john tibbets the tulip fairies near a pixie field in the neighbourhood of dartmoor there lived on a time 
an old woman who possessed a cottage and a very pretty garden, wherein she cultivated a most beautiful bed of tulips. The pixies, it is traditionally averred, so delighted in this spot that they would carry their elfin babies thither and sing them to rest. Often, at the dead hour of the night, a sweet lullaby was heard, and strains of the most melodious music would float in the air, that seemed to owe their origin to no other musicians than the beautiful tulips themselves. And whilst these delicate flowers waved their heads to the evening breeze, it sometimes seemed as if they were marking time to their own singing. As soon as the elfin babies were lulled asleep by such melodies, the pixies would return to the neighbouring field, and there commence dancing, making those rings on the green which showed, even to mortal eyes, what sort of gambols had occupied them during the night season. At the first dawn of light, the watchful pixies once more sought the tulips, and, though still invisible, they could be heard kissing and caressing their babies. The tulips, thus favoured by a race of genii, retained their beauty much longer than any other flowers in the garden, whilst, though contrary to their nature, as the pixies breathed over them, they became as fragrant as roses, and so delighted at all was the old woman who kept the garden that she never suffered a single tulip to be plucked from its stem. At length, however, she died, and the hare who succeeded her destroyed the enchanted flowers, and converted the spot into a parsley bed, a circumstance which so disappointed and offended the pixies, that they caused all the parsley to wither away, and, indeed, for many years nothing would grow in the beds of the whole garden. These sprites, however, though eager in resenting an injury, were, like most warm spirits, equally capable of returning a benefit, and if they destroyed the product of the good old woman's garden when it had fallen into unworthy hands, they tended the bed that wrapped her clay with affectionate solicitude. They were heard lamenting and singing sweet dirges around her grave, nor did they neglect to pay this mournful tribute to her memory every night before the moon was at the full. For then their high solemnity of dancing, singing, and rejoicing took place, to hail the queen of the night on completing her circle in the heavens. No human hand ever tended the grave of the poor old woman who had nurtured the tulip bed for the delight of these elfin creatures. But no rank weed was ever seen to grow upon it. The sod was ever green, and the prettiest flowers would spring up without sowing or planting. And so they continued to do, until it was supposed that the mortal body was reduced to its original dust. End of section 7